part two of the Ancient World Mysteries Osberg. This is actually the second time I'm recording this intro because the first time I did it outside, it sounded like I was in the middle of a natural disaster. And this wind issue does pop up randomly at the worst times throughout this video, like a boner. But it's not bad. It's only in like 5% of the video. 95% of it is wind free. I apologize for that. I didn't have the wind screen on the microphone like a big doofus. So you can blame that solely on me. I just wanted to warn you. But with the unfortunate news out of the way, the good news is we can go ahead and hop into the iceberg, starting off on level 3 with the entry. Ancient automatons, not ancient autobots like I initially thought for some goofy reason, but just to lay the groundwork, an automaton is a human-made machine that is practically self-operating. A good example of this would be a modern day clock. And we actually wouldn't have all the automation we have today without ancient automatons. These old machines can be traced back all the way to ancient Greece with even the word automatons coming from the Greeks. More specifically, the poet Homer. From all his epic poems he wrote, you can find mention of automatons like self-moving tables in Olympus and even robots created by Hephaestus. All throughout Greek mythology, there are mentions of these automatons. But automatons were not only restricted to Greek myth because they built self-directed machines that they used in the real world. For example, we found evidence suggesting that they had automatons of an eagle and a dolphin on display at their Olympic Games. And many of their automated creations were only toys until an inventor known as Philon of Byzantinium created a repeating crossbow sometime between 280 and 220 BC. And during the Hellenistic period is where automation really seen huge advancements took major leaps and bounds forward because inventors began using complex systems of levers, pulleys, and wheels to build these self-operating machinery. There was even a book written on it called On Automaton Making, written by one simply known as the Hero of Alexandria. And this book, what was inside it, it had some pretty insane things like hydraulic systems, wind-operated machines, and even self-propelled carts. There were many more examples of ancient automatons other than what I've discussed here, like Roman robots, for example. Those are a pretty crazy one. But all of this automation came to an end in the ancient world alongside the collapse of the Roman Empire because much of the knowledge on the subject was lost due to it being destroyed or just simply lost due to poor rec record keeping. But that doesn't mean every bit of it was destroyed because much of it did survive and it was later used by the Byzantines and the Arabs to build machines based on Greek and Roman models. And if it weren't for these ancient automation advancements, we wouldn't be surrounded by the amazing technology and automation we see every day. And now our next entry that I also have to redo because of the vicious wind outside is the Gundestrup Cauldron. This cauldron was a huge discovery that gave us more understanding of the Celtic mythos as well as their culture. But to start at the beginning to back it all up to where it began, this was discovered in 1891 in, you, you can read that word, you can also read that word, near Gundistrup in Denmark. The age of the cauldron is really hard to tell exactly, but it's estimated to be from 150 to 1 BCE. So a daggone long time ago. And they think this cauldron was forged somewhere in the Balkans with that word metalwork. And it consists of 12 inner and outer panels, a bowl base with metal rims. And upon analysis, the cauldron, they discovered it was 97% silver and 3% gold. But the biggest part of it is that it had engravings on this metal of Celtic iconography like the Celtic god Serenos, a bull hunting scene, and warriors being reborn. And after everything they eventually learned about this cauldron, after its discovery, they think that its purpose was intended for religious or ceremonial use. However, the case for all these entries, you're going to soon find out, we'll never know 100% for sure what it was actually created for and who even created it. But I think something's more fun when it's shrouded in mystery. I think Scooby and the gang would agree with me on that one. Now I'm going to go ahead and teleport back outside, back to the original footage for the rest of this video. There are going to be some wind spots here and there, but if you can bear listening to my voice, you can stand a little bit of wind. The Long Man of Wilmington. <laughs> I'm using every fiber of my being not to make a really bad immature penis joke right now, even though that kind of just indirectly did make one, but whatever. The Long Man of Wilmington, also known as the Wilmington Giant, is a human-shaped hill figure on the steep slopes of Wendover Hill near... near, near 
I can't speak right now, man. I think it's it's too cold to speak out here. My teeth are chattering, and that's why I'm messing up words. I'm going. Eh, 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 eh. It's on Wendover Hill near Wilmington, East Sussex, England. This figure was made to look proportionate when viewed from below, and was formerly thought to originate from the Iron Age or maybe the Neolithic period. But in 2003, archaeologist investigations showed the figure may have been made in the early modern era during the 16th or 17th century AD. It looks like it was made by some kids drawing on the sidewalk with chalk or maybe someone like took their kids drawing off the fridge and made it into a, a grass shaving. <laughs> it kind of looks a bit goofy to be honest, but it was actually made with white chalk breeze blocks and lime mortar. Its origins remain unclear also, but there's a well-known story that says the long man had been cut by monks from a nearby Wilmington priority and was supposed to represent a pilgrim, but this isn't believed by most scholars because they think the monks wouldn't have drawn an unclothed figure. But the earliest record of this figure was from 1766 when William Burrell drew it when visiting Wilmington Priory, but his drawing shows the figure holding a rake and a scythe both of which are shorter than what we currently see on the present staves. Darius the Mede is a man mentioned in the Bible in the book of Daniel more specifically, and he was said to be the king of Babylon who reigned between Belzar and Cyrus the Great. But the thing is, he isn't known to history whatsoever. Not a single strand of his pubic hair can be found, which leads scholars and researchers to believe that he was a work of literary fiction. But through their best efforts, they've tried to sync up the book of Daniel with actual history and identify him with a few figures like Cyrus, Syaxerus, and Gobirus. I didn't say any of those right, I'm sure. And that's about all we know, really. He's like a locked character in a video game. You can only tell very little about him unless we come to find out much more. Rongorongo. That's not a Japanese word. I don't know why I said it like that. Rongorongo. For, for this, we have to travel back to Easter Island like we did in part one for the Moi statues. But this is a mystery that is connected to the Maui statues. Mio, Maui, I don't know how you say it. But the Rongorongo is a set of etched symbols that were discovered during the 19th century on 26 different wood tablets. And these tablets, while discovered in 1864, have no known origin date. They just estimate they were made sometime in the 13th century, but the intricate designs of the Rongorongo appear to be glyphs or a writing system of sorts. And some even believe that decoding these symbols could give us insight to the collapse of the ancient Easter Island civilization, but until then, all we have is these neat, meaningless symbols to stare at. Very nice. The Black Sea Flood. The Black Sea is a black lake that used to be part of the Mediterranean Sea, but it was cut off by a high piece of land that dammed the entry of seawater through a narrow place called the Bosphorus Valley. But this Black Sea Flood allegedly took place about 9,400 years ago when the Mediterranean waters rose above the dam, which reconnected the Black Sea to the Aegean Sea, and they flowed over top of the Bo Bosphorus Sill with the force of 200 Niagara Falls. And a pretty divisive theory from 1977 at Columbia University says that this flood could have wiped out early human set settlements around the lake's perimeter and could have been the inspiration for stories like Noah's Ark, the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh as well, and all the other flood myths that we talked about in part one. But a new study suggests that the flood, if it even happened, was much smaller and not near biblical proportions. They think it raised only five to 10 meters around that time, not 50 to 60 meters like previously suggested. So the water would have drowned an area similar in size to half of Rhode Island instead, instead of something like the size of West Virginia, which is the state I'm currently in, like previously thought. So it's hard to say whether this flood was as big as initially thought, smaller than initially thought, or if it simply never happened at all. Vinca symbols, discovered in 1875 and sometimes known as the Danube script, are a set of untranslated symbols, we'll come to see a lot of those, found on Neolithic era artifacts from Vinca culture and also somewhat related to old European cultures of Central and Southeastern Europe. And the main debate over the script is if it's the earliest known human writing system or if it's just a bunch of symbols, as it's referred to as pre-rotting or photo-rotting. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> Ancient Greek Zombies. I hate to be the post-Christmas Grinch and spoil the fun so soon, but this isn't like the Walking Dead Zombies or Marvel Zombies. It's in reference to two ancient Grecian graves discovered that contain skeletons inside who have been pinned down with heavy objects like 
rocks, almost as if they didn't want the dead coming back from the grave. And archaeologists have been trying to solve this mystery since the 80s, but a new study suggests that the people in the grave were called revenants, or what's known as revenants, which the ancient Greeks believed were capable of leaving the grave and harming the living. So, ancient zombies, pretty much. So the reason the ancient Greeks performed these types of burials was out of superstition, it seems is the most likely case. And even one of these graves had a child's bones in it, so this is some pretty wild stuff right here. But I guess it worked because they didn't come back from the grave, did they? <laughs> Hermes, that word, you can read it for yourself, is a legendary figure from the Hellenistic period that was a result of a syncretic combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. And the syncretic combination, I can't really pronounce that first word, but it's basically just a fusion dance between the two different beliefs or schools of thought. So you just force them together and treat them as one god, practically. So they just kind of like touch tips, and now they're one god. But anyways, Hermes' unintelligible last name was the supposed author of the Hermectica, which was a wildly diverse set of ancient and medieval texts that laid the groundwork of various philosophical systems known as Hermeticism. This figure, though, was said to have the knowledge of the spiritual and the material world, the best of both worlds, you could say, which rendered the writings attributed to him of great relevance to anyone interested in interrelationship between the material and the divine. This figure can also be found in both Islamic and Baha'i writings. Mithras and Mithraism. So, Mithraism was an underground Roman religious group that worshipped a pagan deity called Mithras. All Mithraea featured a, I don't know how to say that word, which is an image of the god Mithras slaying a sacred bull. And ruins of Mithras temples have been found all over the place really, but this wasn't a small religion by any means also. Some historians say that it was so widespread at a point that it was considered a rival sister religion to Christianity. But overall, not much is known about the religion itself, and it's left people scratching their noggins for nearly 2,000 years, because mem members of this cult-like religion appear to have not left behind any reputable written accounts of their inner workings of this religion. And if they did, it's all been lost to time. So that's left historians and scholars to do everything they can to solve this seemingly unsolvable mystery. I don't think even Batman and Sherlock Holmes, if they did a fusing, fusion dance, could crack this one. Maybe Scooby and the gang, though, they could probably get it done. But while there's no stone-cold facts to use, they do have some clues from the discovered temples to go off of, and that's what they're using to crack this case. But a man named David Yelasny thinks he may have solved this puzzle. His theory says the cult's central iconography is the star map. The bull that Mithras kills is actually the zodiac Taurus, and by slaying it, the god is responsible for shifti shifting the procession of the equinoxes. And that is supposedly the secret cosmic movement that was shared among indoctrinated members of the ancient cult during the time when the universe was still seen as a never-moving entity. But that theory can't be proven or really disproven due to the aforementioned lack of knowledge of the inner workings of this cult-top religion. And on top of that, they aren't even sure where the god Mithras himself even comes from or is based on. Plutonian at Hierapolis. So to start, I need to explain what a Plutonian is. It's basically a sanctuary that's specially dedicated to the ancient Greek god Pluton. And these stru structures were built in areas thought to produce poisonous emissions and were considered to represent an entrance straight to the underworld. And this entry specifically refers to one of these structures at a place called Hierapolis. And this city became well known throughout the entire Roman world for another reason besides being a major spa town, it's a much more sinister reason because it was said to be the location of a gate to hell. And a shrine called a Plutonian was built on this site. This site became a very popular place for pilgrims to travel and to sacrifice things, offering them up to the god Pluto. And writers from the time describe these occurrences as chilling spectacles because a priest would lead an animal into the shrine, and as if by the hand of God, they would drop dead instantly. Now, I know you may be thinking, how did the animal die and not the priest, or you may just be saying that this isn't true whatsoever, but I'll touch on all that just in a second. So through research, they were able to discover what made this wild spectacle happen. It's because there are toxic levels of carbon dioxide in the air around the shrine location, so to put that in perspective, normal levels are 0.4% CO2, and this area had a staggering 80% CO2 level in the air. And to put that in perspective, a few minutes of exposure to 10% CO2 
will kill you. And these high levels are due to the shrine being built on a Pamukkale fault, not actually being a portal to hell by the way. But the Pamuke Fault, or however you say that word, is a 35 kilometer long active fault zone that allows these deadly gases to escape. So it's like a butt crack for the earth, pretty much, after a really bad Taco Tuesday. And as for the animals dying and not the priest, it's believed it's because the animals were much lower to the ground. And since CO2 is heavier than air, it rests very much lower and is far deadlier to things that are lower to the ground as opposed to higher up. The Antikythera Mechanics. This piece of ancient history was discovered in 1900 when a diver went diving in the East Mediterranean around the island of Simi. After he went down and poked his nose into a couple things, he resurfaced and began rambling about a heap of dead naked people, which just so happened to turn out to be marble sculptures scattered along the sea floor along with many other artifacts. And one of these items found among them was a lump the size of a dictionary that initially didn't capture much interest until many months later at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens when the lump broke apart and revealed bronze precision gear wheels the size of coins. And according to archaeologists, gears like the ones they discovered shouldn't have existed at the time in ancient Greece or anywhere else in the world to be specific. But now this lump is known as the Anti-Kythera Mechanism and it's flabbergasted historians and scientists for well over 120 years now. But since it initially broke apart, it has continued to break apart into 4, 84, 82, not 84, I can't read, 84 pieces now, resulting in possibly the hardest jigsaw puzzle to date. And today, we have a grasp on some of its functions, but much of it still remains a huge mystery. So what could this ancient mechanism from 60 to 70 BCE really be hiding from us, and what was its purpose for creation? The Lost Mine of Ophir. This is in reference to King Solomon and his immense wealth of gold he had. Uh, it was said that he got the gold from the mine Ophir and would have totaled around $60 trillion worth of gold today, well over 500 tons overall, an absolute absurd amount. But the issue is that no one can agree where Ophir is or if it even existed, because there's never a reference to a specific location. The only thing we have to go on is just general clues that could be referring to several different places. So naturally, there are several theories about the location of Solomon's mines. Archaeologists have found copper mines in Israel and Jordan, which they claim are the mines of Solomon, where he gained his wealth from. However, there's not enough conclusive evidence, which means the search is still very well well ongoing. There are other locations mentioned as well, like mines in Africa, Asia, and even the Americas, none of which can be confirmed either, obviously. And another popular theory is that the name could have been lost in translation, so they think the original name of the mine could still be in the original Hebrew text, and it's not actually Ophir. But who knows? That's None of that's concrete, and that's why it's on the Ancient World Mysteries iceberg. By the way, Please don't play a drinking game every time I say mystery, though, or you will definitely die from alcohol poisoning. Woodhinge, for when you're too poverty to afford Stonehenge. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. But it is actually referred to as the lesser-known neighbor of Stonehenge. It's a Neolithic construction in present-day present day Wiltshire that consists of six concentric circles of six, I don't, I just had a seizure during mid-sentence. It consists of six concentric rings of timber dating back to about 2500 BC. And it's located only two miles away from Stonehenge, hence why it's called the lesser known neighbor. But I never have heard of this until doing research on it, so I guess that, you know, the nickname's true. It's like the red-headed stepchild of Stonehenge. Nobody really cares about it. <laughs> But it is thought that this was built by the same people who initially built Stonehenge. Uh, and to be fair though, it isn't as cool as Stonehenge, which could be the reason it's less popular. And there are theories, of course, for this site. They think it was used as like a warm-up of sorts before they built Stonehenge, so they made sure they got it right. That was disproven though, because Stonehenge was built far before this was. So now it's widely believed that this is a burial site or had some ceremonial purpose in the ancient times. Anunnaki. Now we get into a slot overlap with the conspiracy theory iceberg because Anunnaki are a group of deities from the ancient Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. According to early Sumerian writings though, these gods are a pantheon of deities and are descendants of on and Ki, the god of the heavens and the goddess of earth, and their main function was to decree the fates of humanity, 
the oldest of the bunch of the Anunnaki being Enil, Enlil, the god of the air, and the chief god of the Sumerian pantheon. So he's like Zeus, pretty much. He's the top dog. But the Sumerians believed that it was Enlil who separated the heaven and the earth, and that before him, the two things were inseparable. They were as one. And now, this is where we get into the conspiracy theory territory, so go ahead and plop your tinfoil hat on, set on your tinfoil dildo, whatever you have to do to get into the spirit of conspiracy theories. So some believe that these gods were real, and that they come from the mysterious Planet X. <laughs> <laughs> which was said to have passed very close to Earth thousands of years ago, allowing them to, you know, hop over and come here. And they say the purpose the Anunnaki came here from Planet X was to force humans to be their slaves and mine gold for them. Because they would need gold on their planet, presumably because their economy works much the same as ours. But anyways, when they had what they needed, all the gold they could mine up, all the resources they could take off of Earth, they supposedly left and returned to Planet X. Some goofballs, though, even go as far as saying Anunnaki were reptilian humanoids who helped the Sumerians develop <laughs> their rotting systems and mathematics. And they think these reptilians are still around today controlling the human world from the shadows like puppeteers. Reptilian puppeteers. Skelly puppeteers. So yeah, the Anunnaki are definitely an interesting glimpse into the ancient way of life and their belief systems. But it's also a good wake-up call and a reminder that people are dumb as ever today. <laughs> Hopperborea. They were a mythical people who lived in the far northern part of the known world. Despite being located in a northern and frigid area, the Hopperboreans were believed to inhabit a sunny, temperate, and divinity-blessed land. In many versions of the story, they lived north of the Riffian Mountains, which shielded them from the effects of the cold north wind. And it's said in the mythos that the only way to reach Hopperborea was the use of enormous swans. So that, those little those little swan boats that you paddle across, across the lake. Like that, but a bit bigger, and you rode on their backs. However, later on, riders disagreed on the existence and location of the Hopperboreans, with some regarding them as purely mythological, and others connecting them to real-world people and places in northern Eurasia. Pretty much just envision a fantasy utopia, and that's practically what Hyperborea is. Sounds very sci-fi. I may even be reading off the wrong thing. I might have just like copied from some sci-fi book or game or something. I don't know. I might have just read you something off of a fandom website. <laughs> Newgrange. These are ancient tombs that somehow keep perfect time. Hello, Jasper. My doggy. Look. Doggy. Doggy, doggy. Doggy, doggy. Sorry, I had a fluffy intruder there that kind of made me break my train of thought, but Newgrange are ancient tombs that somehow keep perfect time and even act as calendars. But let's back it up real quick to the creation of these wonderful mysteries. They are located in an Irish country called Meath, north of Dublin, and were built around 3200 BC during the Neolithic era. They far predate Stonehenge and even the Pyramids of Giza, and Newgrange was built with astrological alignment as well, which means on the morning of the winter solstice, the central chamber is briefly illuminated by the rising sun's rays that come through the passage. Seems a lot of these ancient creations, though, were aligned astronomically, and when all of our knowledge tells us they shouldn't have had the capabilities of performing stuff like this with their lack of technology so the more we discover the more we find out we don't really know anything about our ancient ancestors and it seems like all these ancient civilizations had some dwarfs among them that could just build anything and everything they wanted they were magical with tools and hammers got another fluffy intruder hello fluffy intruder oh you smell like poop oh my god do you have poop on you i think he has poop on him he smells worse than a porta potty. <laughs> Roman, that word. Read it for yourself again. There are more than 100 of these objects found in areas that have been part of the Roman Empire. And these objects are all hollow and made of bronze. They have a geometric shape with 12 flat faces and an. an e a little, 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 little. And each face is a pentagon. That's what I was trying to say. And they're all embellished with a series of knobs that are on each corner of the pentagons. These neat little things, though, have befuddled people for quite a long time since they were first discovered 200 years ago. And today, this mystery still isn't fully untangled with researchers constantly trying to understand their origin as, and as well as their purpose. But some of the most common theories for these things include a candlestick holder, flower stands, staff decoration, 
decorations, scepter decorations, fortune telling devices, children's toys, dosses, measuring devices, or a bludgeon. So they're pretty much like an all in one. You buy this, you don't need to buy anything else for the rest of your life. But the most accepted among these is that it was a measuring device and that it was used to measure ranges on the battlefield. The Bend Pyramid of Sneferu. This is one of the most unusual pyramids in the history of ancient Egypt. It was one of the first pyramids that was built as well, located at the Egyptian Royal Necropolis at Dasher. The ancient Egyptian name for this pyramid was the Southern Shining One because it was constructed with polished and shining Tura limestone. The pyramid, though, was built under Egyptian Old Kingdom Pharaoh named Sneferu around 2600 BC, and it was actually his stepson, Khufu, who oversaw the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza in the years to come. Fun little fact, but back to uh, old Sneferu. His pyramid, though, got its name, the Bent Pyramid, because it has steep changes in its slope. The walls of the lower part of the pyramid rise at like a 54 degree angle, and then right above the base, there's an abrupt flattening of the slope to 43 degrees, which is what gives it its distinct bent shape. And as for the theories, some think it was intentionally built like this when the pharaoh heard of another one of the pyramids collapsing, so he wanted to make it more structurally integral, make it stronger. And another theory says he may have just built it like this to speed up the process and complete the pyramid faster. And by far the goofiest theory, in my opinion, is that some believe he had the pyramid, pyramid bent like this for religious reasons. Because, you know, those Egyptian gods love their pyramids to be bent. But there's also some theories about hidden rooms in this pyramid because not all of it has been explored. And on top of that, Pharaoh Sneferu's remains have never been found, so who knows? We may have some secrets coming coming for us out of this pyramid. Now, we made it to the last entry of level 3, the mystery of the Pleiadians across various civilizations. So, to start, the Pleiadians are, in Greek mythology, the seven daughters of Titan, Atlas, and the Oceanid Pleon. And these children are supposed to have eventually formed a constellation in the stars, and this entry is relating to how several different cultures have very similar stories all about this same star cluster, dating all the way back to 100,000 years ago. The similar stories are all over the place in Europe, Africa, Asia, Indonesia, Native America, and Aboriginal Australia cultures. And the story is very familiar in all accounts of it. It includes things like the lost sister and moving stars, and it's thought that the tale of the seven sisters and Orion is so old, it could have been told around campfires in Africa 100,000 years ago and could potentially be the oldest story in the world. Moving down to level four now, and apparently growing a beard, we start off with Ain Dara's footprints. These are some ancient feet pics. The end. <laughs> but in all seriousness, these footprints are a pretty big deal because they are far too big to be human, and some think they are the feet print of God entering his house. And the feet prints are located in northern Syria in Ain Dara, which consists of complex buildings built around a large central temple, which is where the footprints are, by the way. And the temple is believed to be a Syro Hittiti temple from the Iron Age. It was discovered in 1955 and was determined to be in use for about 550 years from 1300 to 740 BC. But to get back to the feet pics real quick, at the entrance of the main hall, the size of the feet suggests that the person they belong to would have been about 65 feet tall because the distance between the prints themselves is 30 feet. So the theories for this mystery are, of course, the aforementioned God leaving them to even ancient giants, giants leaving them. But unfortunately, we won't ever know the true nature of these perplexingly large feet because sadly, in 2018, it was reported that the Ain Dara temple was largely destroyed due to airstrikes by Turkish Turkish air forces. So screw you, Turkey. I'm never eating your food for Thanksgiving again. But it is unfortunate and truly sad that we'll never get to examine and truly figure out who left these cartoonishly large footprints. Dogu, which is Japanese for earth figure, are small humanoid and animal figurines made during the later part of the Jomon period. 
1400 through 400 BC. The National Museum of Japanese History says there are around 15,000 of these statues, and most of them are found in eastern Japan, with it being rare to find them in western Japan. And the purpose of these statues is obviously unknown, or they wouldn't be on this iceberg, but the main theory is that they were effigies of people that manifested a sort of sympathetic magic, like removing an illness and putting it into the statue. Nebra Sky Disc, often referred to as the world's oldest map of the stars, is a circular copper plate 12 inches in diameter, about the size of a medium pizza, just for reference. It contains inlaid circles and crescents representing stars, the moon, and possibly the sun, with stars dotted all around. But this disc has been the topic of much debate, with a number of different interpretations of what's depicted. Some believe it is the earliest representation of astrological phenomena dating way back to 1600 BC, but other archaeologists believe that none of this is true, and it's not really that old. They even question if it's a map at all. They think it's more of an abstract work of art, but whatever the case, it's definitely an interesting artifact and a very important one if they ever get to the bottom of the mystery. Silphium. This is in reference to an herb from the time of Julius Caesar. I, I gotta say, he makes a daggone good salad. But according to the stories, Caesar kept a cache of it in the government treasury, and they even used it in money. It was worth its weight in gold, but now no one knows if it even still exists. But a description of the herb says that it had stout roots, stumpy leaves, and bunches of small yellow flowers, but it oozed sap that was delicious and also very useful, being said that to name its uses would be endless. And it apparently seemed like the miracle herb as well, and Theophagus Astrus, the father of botany, said that it stumped even the most enthusiastic plant geeks of the day. As for the origins of the plant, though, the legend has it that it sprouted up after a black rain washed over the east coast of Libya over two and a half millennia ago, and ever since then it grew luxuriantly on hillsides and forest meadows, but of course, Today, we can't find a trace of this stuff, and it most likely went extinct. Stone Spheres of Costa Rica. This is referencing over 300 petrospheres, often called the Diquis Spheres. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually Diquis, but... <laughs> and they can be located on the island Kenyo, as well as the Diquis Delta. They are believed to have originated from a now extinct Diquis culture. <laughs> Dude, I'm so immature. During the period of 800 and 1500 AD, these spheres also range pretty drastically in size, from just a few centimeters to two meters in diameter. And there's one, uh, the largest one right here, that were modeled off of my balls because they said they needed a reference image for massive balls. But just like every other entry, their purpose is still up for debate, with multiple theories being thrown around. Some think they were a symbol of status, while other thinks, others think they were used for religious or ceremonial purposes. Tutankhamun's Iron Dagger. In 1922, a century ago, a massive discovery was made when they discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun in the Valley of Kings which is the ancient necropolis of the pharaohs of Egypt. And among all the valuable items found in his tomb, one stuck out among the rest. It was a small dagger made of iron. And the dagger is about a foot long and fitted into a gold handle, which is very decorated. But the part that stunned the archaeologist is that the dagger was made of iron. It may not seem like a big deal on the surface level, but the reason it's a big head scratcher is because Iron Age technologies were in their infancy at the time, and the Iron Age for Egypt was still centuries away, so they shouldn't have been able to make this item. So how exactly did the young king have a supposedly impossible item to make. Well, it's very unlikely that the dagger was added in later on after his death, if you were wondering that. But the most accepted theory is that since the blade was made up of iron, cobalt, and had nickel traces, which just so happens to be the natural composition of meteorite, that is what they think it is. A dagger made of meteorite, so technically the dagger could be from out of this world. I'm sitting here freezing my balls off, man. I'm shaking. You can probably hear my teeth chattering genuinely now. I need to finish this up. What are the Vimians? Vimians. What are the Viminans? A Vimna is a word that has several meanings that range from flying temple or palace to mythological flying machines described in mythology of Sanskrit and Hindu text. But in addition to being able to fly in Earth's atmosphere, Vim Vinum, Vinans, Viminus, were said to also be able to act as spacecrafts and submarines by traveling in space 
and or underwater. The Vimanus came in many shapes and sizes and had two or more engines, as well as deadly weapons because apparently their main purpose was to be built for Warcraft purposes. So pretty much these are ancient flying cars that are more like flying saucers than cars, but they kind of look like gumdrops of sorts. It'd be pretty cool though if these things actually did exist, we'd probably be living like the Jetsons by now. Baghdad Battery. This is referencing a set of three artifacts found together, which were a ceramic pot, a tube of copper, and an iron rod. It was discovered in modern Iraq in 1936 and is believed to date back to sometime between 150 to 650 AD. And, and here's the line you've been waiting for. Its origin and purpose remain unclear. It's hypothesized, though, that it may have functioned as a galvanic cell for electroplating or some kind of electrotherapy, but there aren't any known electroplated objects from this time period, so that doesn't really make sense. But another theory is that it functioned as a storage vessel for sacred scrolls, which does sound more likely. Joseph Smith Papery. This dude is the United States founder of the Latter-day Saint movement, aka the Mormons. And his inspiration for Mormonism came from many places, but oddly enough, it seems to draw a bit from ancient Egypt. The source materials he used included Egyptian funerary papyrus fragments known as the Joseph Smith Papyri, which is very real by the way and has survived to this day, at least mostly, but the fragment or originates from ancient Thebes and were formerly owned by Joseph Smith along with four mummies, and according to Joseph himself, the papyrus held records of Abraham and Joseph from biblical lore. But it is also worth mentioning that what he discovered wasn't completely unusual it's more so unique because of the individual who owned it rather than the artifact itself. Because Joseph claimed that these two roles were physically authored by Abraham and Joseph from the Bible themselves, even claiming hieroglyphs on them were Abraham's signature that he left to sign his artwork he did. And just to talk about the four mummies this dude Joseph owned, it turns out, according to him, they were Pharaoh Onatus, his wife, and their two daughters, one of which Joseph named Katumin. And Joseph's mother was also quite the oddball, so I guess the apple doesn't far, fall too far from the tree, because she claimed that through divine understanding, she knew that one of the mummy's daughters was the one who saved baby Moses. But divine insight once again loses to cold, hard archaeology, because archaeologists say these mummies are actually thought to be priests and aristocrats from Egypt's ruling class based on where they were discovered and the writings found with them. Also, there aren't any pharaohs or their families family members that had the names Joseph and his mother claimed they did, but basically everything overall this dude did was very shady and not super reliable. Olmec Colossal Heads. The Olmecs were an ancient Mesoamerican civilization in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. They were also the only civilization currently to be dated all the way back to the Stone Age, and all the archaeological evidence we have points to them being a decently sophisticated but small group, and there were three major archaeological ruins attributed to them, the La Venta, Trace Zaptos, and San Lorenzo. The Olmecs were also pretty skilled at sculpting and carving, which leads us to the entry of Olmec colossal heads, because they were carved out of round boulders totaling seven 17 heads overall, between 5 and 12 feet tall, so they were pretty big heads. And there have also been traces of paint found on the heads, which suggests they could have been colorfully painted, and they have flat backs as well, meaning they were meant to be viewed from the front. But these heads have absolutely been baffling researchers, one, because of how they were transported, because they were made from volcanic basalt about 70 kilometers away from where the heads were discovered at. The main theory historians have came up with for this is the wooden roller theory, which I reference in one in part one, by the way, and it just means that they rolled these boulders on top of wooden rollers, slowly inching towards their destination. But this theory doesn't exactly account for the manpower required to move a 40-ton head, or the fact that the Olmec territory was marshland, so that doesn't seem like it would really work. So it's once again hard to tell the real story behind yet another ancient structure that shouldn't have been able to exist at the time. The Lost Labyrinth of Egypt. Below the sand of a famous pyramid site, the Pyramid of Hora, lays the thought to be mythical remains of the Lost Labyrinth, and Herodotus claims he counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid complex during the 5th century BC. These labyrinths were mentioned in 
ancient local text and thought to be only legends until they were rediscovered. And it's said that this labyrinth could hold the secrets to humankind and even give us details as about unknown civilizations and the rulers that lived on the planet before history as we know it began. But as of now, we haven't explored these magical labyrinths. We can only confirm their existence, and that's really about it. So we'll just be patiently awaiting those secrets to everything the stories promised. Maybe there's a map to the everlasting boner pill in there or something. The Toland Man and Other Bog Bodies. There's a place called this word, bog, and inside this bog are some pretty crazy things, like bodies buried that are naturally mummified in a peak peaked bod to look like this. And among these is a corpse known as the Toland Man. He is said to have lived sometime during 405 to 380 BC and was discovered in 1950. And upon closer examination of the man, he had not suffered any injuries beside his obvious hanging, and they concluded that the part that hanging was part of the ritual sacrifice due to the time he was killed and where he was buried at. Researchers believe that the bog was seen as half earth, half water, and open to the heavens, making it easier to communicate with the gods. And this isn't the only bog body discovered in the area, which leads to the idea that this bog was a special place to those who used it for these burials. And crazily enough, it wasn't just the outside of the man's body that was very well preserved. His intestines were too, which allowed researchers to examine and determine what his last meal would have been. They said he ate about 12 to 24 hours before his execution, and his meal was likely a porridge due to the seeds and the grain found, and newer analysis says he likely ate fish and even ill in his last meal. But this discovery which was a huge deal for filling in the gaps of the Iron Age history. Mystery of the Varna Gold. This is in reference to treasure found in prehistoric graves in Bulgaria. It's the first evidence we have of ancient hierocracies, her but no one knows what has caused these civilizations to decline. Uh, I swear the cold's getting to me, man. I can't think. I can't speak. The gold itself, though, is estimated to be worth $180,000, but it's said its artistic and scientific values is beyond calculation. And according to carbon dating, this gold comes from about 6,500 years ago, meaning they were only created a few centuries after the first migrant farmers moved to Europe. And until that morning they discovered the gold, all the artifacts from the Copper Age weighed less than a pound, and what they discovered in initially in the graves was double that, so that's pretty pretty massive deal. Where the Sumerians came from? As you probably know, the Sumerians were one of humanity's first great civilizations located in Mesopotamia around 6,000 years ago, and there are mysteries upon mysteries surrounding this civilization. One of those being, where exactly did they originate from? And just to preface the website I gathered the information from for this entry, it has biblical amounts of information that is not only hard to wrap my head around, it's also just way too much to explain, so I'm not going to explain it thoroughly. I may even get some of it wrong, but basically they used various methods of getting DNA to try to pin down exactly who the ancient Sumerians were and where they came from. And this is a direct quote from their in conclusion statement. It says, in conclusion, our data shows that the modern Marsh Arabs of Iraq harbor mtDNAs and Y chromosomes that are predominantly of Middle Eastern origin. Therefore, certain cultural features of the area, such as water buffalo breeding and rice farming, which were most likely introduced from the Indian subcontinent, only marginally affected the gene pool of the Achanras people of the region. Moreover, a Middle Eastern ancestral origin of the modern population of the marshes of southern Iraq implies that if the marsh Arabs are descendants of the ancient Sumerians, also Sumerians were not of Indian or southern Asian ancestry. Karnak Stones The Karnak Stones are roughly 4,000 missing pieces of prehistoric stones perfectly lined up in a series of fields in Brittany. The stones date back to somewhere around 4500 BCE through 3300 BCE and stretch nearly a mile in length. As for the stone size, they range from 1 to 4 meters high, and while they have been studied and analyzed, no one has been able to come up with a solid purpose as to why they were created and placed how they were. But this is where people of the Karnak stepped in to fill in this void of knowledge with a fairy tale of their own. According to them, the stones were a Roman army that was turned to stone by Merlin, yeah, the gray-pubed wizard that lived during the time of King Arthur. 
But there also is an alternate version to suit the Christians out there that says, The stones are an army of fleeing pagans turned to stone by Pope Cornelius of the Child Lovers. <laughs> So obviously, we don't have solid evidence to back the answers to these stones, and we probably never will, so pick your favorite of those two tales. Kofun, translated from Japanese as ancient graves, are megalithic tombs or tumuli in Northeast Asia. Kofun were mainly constructed in the Japanese archipelago between the middle of the 3rd century and to the 7th century CE. And these things have taken various shapes throughout history. The most common ones are shaped like a keyhole with one square and one circular end when viewed from above. And these things are huge, measuring several hundred meters across and are surrounded with a moat. Probably not with alligators, unfortunately. They contain valuables though, like bronze and iron goods, and are protected by terracotta figurines called Haniwa. They symbolize power and wealth, much like the pyramids do for ancient pharaohs. Rupkund, known to locals as Mystery Lake or Skeleton Lake, is a very high altitude glacial lake located in the Indian Himalayas. And the mystery surrounding this lake starts with a 1942 discovery by H.K. Madwell when he stumbled upon hundreds of human skeletons stockpiled around the Rupkund Lake. He of course reported it, and now we know that the place had around 300 to 800 people that unfortunately met their in there. And it was only because of the frigid conditions that the remains were preserved. Initially, the skeletons were thought to be belonging to Japanese soldiers or Tibetan traders on the Silk Road who died due to either an epidemic or exposure to the elements. Much like me, I'm being exposed to the elements right now. My toes are gone. Later though, after forensic analysis in 2004, the best theory was that the group of Indian pilgrims, both men and women, assisted by local porters from the region, were struck by a giant hell at Rupkund in a single event in the 9th century, which they concluded from the injuries on the skulls. But in 2010, the first human genome was sequenced, which allowed us to much better study our past, and soon, 38 of the Rupkund powdered bone samples were sent to 16 labs worldwide for analysis. This revived the Skeleton Lake mystery, but also revealed a shocking discovery. The study showed that the 38 skeletons belonged to three genetically distinct groups and were dumped at the lake during multiple events over a 1,000 year period. But th this far from solved the mystery, according to Musrif Tif Tifli, who was part of the 2019 investigation, they said, According to me, the mystery is not at all solved. We have more questions than answers. So if just 38 samples had this kind of impact, imagine what the other secrets to this lake and the remaining skeletons could hold. I gotta go inside though. I'm shaking and shivering. My toes are cold. I gotta go inside. I'll finish the last two, three entries inside. I'm in a much more comfortable setting now. I can feel my appendages once again. So let's knock out these last three entries. The Civitherium of Kish. A Civitherium is an extinct genus of primordial giraffids that once roamed the Indian subcontinent and all throughout Africa. However, scholars agree that it has been extinct for a very long time, roughly a million years to be exact. That's a bit older than your grandmother. And the mystery here is that there is a unique copper rain ring that was discovered in the remnants of ancient Kish in modern day Iraq, and the animal depicted on the object is uncannily similar to the aforementioned Civitherium. So how did an animal from the primordial times somehow thrip, slip through the cracks of Tom and live into the dawn of civilization? Well, to take a step back and talk about the discovered object, the rain ring isn't a special thing in and of itself. It's not a special artifact, but the animal depicted on it is what's baffling researchers because animals on these objects are typically like horses or cows or just, you know, common animals like that but not prehistoric giraffes. And due to the shocking accuracy depicted on the animal, it's not thought to be like a fantastical beast from imagination land, and it suggests the sculptor saw the animal firsthand. However, there is a debate among scholars. Some think the Civitherium was alive with the Sumerians, and that is what depicted, while others think that it's a poor rendition of a fallow deer, and that the Civitherium truly has been extinct for over a million years. But, like it always is in the end, a debate is all it will ever be. But I do want to point out that we haven't fully explored 100% of the Earth, so there could be some crazy things out there waiting for us in the Amazon or the ocean. What's actually inside of Quen Shi Huang's tomb? 
Quan Shi, Quan Shi Huang was the first emperor of China that died on September 10th, 210 BC. But the tomb itself is buried deep under a hill in central China, surrounded by an underground moat of poisonous mercury. And the tomb hasn't been disturbed for over two millennia. And whether modern people will ever be able to see the inside of the tomb and potentially unlock some mysteries depends on the Chinese government as well as science. A huge reason no one has attempted to loot the tomb is that we simply lack the technology to properly excavate it. But what we have seen is what's known as the Terracotta Warriors, who stand outside the tomb and protect it. There are thousands upon thousands of these life-sized, uniquely different statues made of clay, and it's roughly estimated there are 8,000 of these superly impressive statues that are pretty baffling to me. They look very cool. But one of the researchers states that they'll be digging for centuries, before they reach the central tomb. So until technology progresses to the point where we can get inside this tomb, we'll be left in the dark with only these cool warrior statues to look at, which I'm not complaining too much. They're pretty cool. Now, the final entry of this video. What was the set animal? So Egyptian mythology is full of animal-headed gods, but one that stands apart from the rest is Set also called Shaw. And Set was believed to have existed in ancient Egyptian times, and according to the Egyptian religion, Set is the god of storms, disorder, violence, destruction, and chaos, and his realm is the Red Land of Death, aka the desert. And the Set animal was called the Typhonic Beast, or a Typhonic Animal, so what exactly was it though? Most Egyptologists believe the animal is just imaginary from ancient Egyptian times, and it never truly existed. However, a bunch of, zootologi of zoologists have made several attempts to locate the mysterious animal recently. Some think it could just be a stylized jackal, hyena, fox, or aardvark. The set animal, though, is depicted as having squared ears that are erect, uh, a long nose with a little downward curve, and the color of the animal is shown to be black or reddish. One of the most accepted theories is that the set animal could have been a Saluki, because a Saluki is the oldest domesticated dog breed with features matching the, matching the animal depicted on set, and has even been depicted in a bunch of hieroglyphs as well, so it would make sense. Other theories, though, say it could represent a now-extinct species that we may never know about, and some also think it could represent an animal like the donkey mixed with a few other animals as well. But it's still very unclear whether this animal existed or not, and brrrr, drum roll, please, we'll probably never get a concrete answer. <laughs> it's a good way to end the video off. But yeah, that's it for the Ancient World Mystery Osberg Part 2. We've now knocked out levels 1 through 4. All we have left is levels 5 and 6, where it's going to get deeper and darker than ever thought possible. I assume. I haven't actually went through it yet. But I'm going to get right on that. <laughs> I'll catch you in the next one, though.